susceptibility factors, I've called these risk factors, could be risk factors as well. And what we've heard from many talks over the past couple of days is these come in, there are various, no, numerous of them. Immuno, immunogenetics, we've had talks about possibility of some genes related to ME that, are in, that regulate the immune system. These could be inherent, acquired, or iatrogenic, so in response to an intervention. Immune dysregulation is very um, topical, and I think this is probably at the core of ME. What the dysregulation is, is it comes in various flavors. It could be autoimmunity, in which case, what are the targets? And there are potentially many targets. Immunosufficiency, an interest this could affect different cells of the immune system, innate immune cells, adaptive immune cells, even natural immunity as well. And then there's senescence, the accelerated aging phenomena, and what might cause that. And then micronutrient deficiencies, we've had a talk earlier, which wasn't talked about here, but in the previous uh, research session about selenium in a sufficiency which could be related to a small sub subset of ME patients. And then viruses, we've heard a lot about viruses as another susceptibility factor, either new infections such as SARS-CoV-2 or latent infections of which the herpes virus are the main candidates. And again, we're now understanding more about these viruses. They don't all live in the blood. They don't all live in peripheral blood cells, they can hide in other tissue sites. So depending on where you sample, you may or may not catch the presence or activation of the virus. And the enterovirus is a really good example of that, which seem to live in the stomach um, and they don't really appear in the blood, but yet they can cause severe symptoms. And interestingly, there's ideas that maybe they don't work alone. They could work together to exacerbate or even cause some disease in some patients. And then it's an interesting question about SARS-CoV-2 and the developing into late uh, long COVID and whether or not some of those will then develop ME. And the thinking is there could be as many as 25% of long COVID patients that might eventually develop ME. So this is sort of a ticking time bomb for ME cases worldwide, I think. We may be grossly underestimating the number of people that could be affected by ME. Microbiomes, again, we've heard a lot about microbiomes, principally focusing on the bacteria. We're neglecting the other components of the microbiome, in particular the viruses and the virome. So if we want to understand if the microbiome is in any way related to ME, cause or effect, we need to and understand the entirety of the microbiome and not just single components. And then the microbiome interacts with the host and the host interacts with the microbiome. And particularly important, this is the immune system. As I've said, the immune system is really reliant, I mean, kept in check by the microbiome. So the reciprocal interactions there that can lead to disease symptoms. And of course, the key question is, does this all occur pre or post ME? And then the mitochondria as well, we've heard that there are intrinsic as well as acquired deficiencies in the mitochondria. So all of these are risk factors or susceptibility factors. And with all of them, we really need to understand the key question at the bottom here. We need to distinguish cause from effect and how these things are all interrelated because they're unlikely to work in isolation. We've had several examples of that. So it's a combination of factors. So that's why it's such a complex disease, trying to unravel what the major players are and how they relate to others. Other key points, so one or many diseases. So clinical subtypes. Um, I think we're taking advantage of some very sophisticated technology and it's allowing us to stratify patients more accurately based on this deep phenotyping particular things like um, the Canadian group are doing is looking at lots of different parameters to sort of classify disease subtypes. And we're interestingly, we're using more and more computational approaches to help integrate and understand a lot of these data sets. This led to the phrase medical networks that allow us to look at a whole variety of things and integrate them together to define better what ME is. And the systems biology, we've had this approach applied to other diseases like inflammatory bowel disease and using combinations of data we can identify patients best able to respond to different types of therapies. So this could be applied to ME so we get more personalized approaches to treating ME. And then we can, if we're looking at the virome, the immune system, the nervous system, again we can use these as markers to stratify and classify patients. And so I think um, all I'm going to compare this to is a jigsaw. We heard earlier that Nancy uh, considered this might be a tapestry or a, 
um, a cloth that we're putting together. But I think a jigsaw is a, a good analogy. So if we imagine ME is just a pile of jigsaw puzzles, and what we've now been able to do is define the edges. So we know what's different from within the ME community from the other diseases. So we know what the parameters are. We just now need to fill in the detail in the middle to complete the picture. And I think as Ron has just said, you know, we're getting much better at f figuring out which pieces go where. So I think the pictures over the next couple of years is going to start to emerge and we can hopefully complete the jigsaw and cure this disease. So the biomarkers, I think they're all going to be tied into what parameters we're assessing in ME patients. So if we're looking at the virome, there could be virus signatures we can use. Same for the immune system, for metabolism, for mitochondria. There are lots of potential biomarkers that will help as clearly defined disease phenotypes and then target appropriate um, uh, measures for that. And really what we need is right at the bottom here, uh, we need longitudinal studies following patients. The SARS, you know, COVID-19 pandemic was a really good opportunity, which I think we've missed because we had the opportunity there of following people from the time they're infected all the way through to, to then identify those that developed long COVID and ME from those that didn't. That would have been a really powerful set of data that we could have utilized to really understand the relationship of virus infections to ME. I think we've missed that opportunity. But still, if we do longitudinal studies in very well-defined clinical cohorts uh, and many different cohorts, then probably totaling the thousands, I think we've got a better chance of distinguishing cause from effect and identifying some of the key drivers of the disease. And in terms of treatments, um, cures, we've heard a lot about this, and there are lots of opportunities. So this conference, I think, has been really good in revealing lots of possible means of treating disease. And I think, again, if we can stratify patients and we can identify those that are best likely to respond to a particular drug, we've got a much better route for uh, treating patients. Drug repurposing, um, we've heard a lot about that. There are lots of drugs used in other diseases, some are inflammatory, some are autoimmune, some are even neurodegenerative, and these could be repurposed for ME. And that would accelerate the clinical trials that we could use to test and evaluate these. So we're not coming up with new drugs, we're just repurposing drugs. Um, and not one size fits all. I think that was a comment that one of the speakers made earlier this week. Uh, we need to be selective in the drugs we're using and making sure they're used in the appropriate patient cohort. And there are lots of potential opportunities here. The mitochondria unblocking energy metabolism. That could be the itoconic shunt. Could be other means that we can unblock and release uh, ATP production from mitochondria. We've got to talk about using low light therapy as well. That's another interesting possibility. And then antivirals, anti-inflammatories, antioxidants. These are all potentially going to be a benefit to some patients. And targeting particular organ systems, I think, is another opportunity whether that be the gut, central nervous system, or whatever. And so that leaves the message at the very bottom here. We need consensus on treatment options. Uh, Jesper Melson talked about trying to get a European consensus on how we can diagnose and treat patients with appropriate outcome measures. And that was something that Christians talked about with the FUNCAP, being able to objectively assess the impact of a particular intervention to determine whether or not it's successful. And we need such measures for measuring functional capacity as well as physical capacity and cognitive function. So where does that leave us? And actually this slide I put up two years ago and in some ways it's still pertinent now. Uh, we obviously need more money. And I think finally there's good hope in terms of the UK and certainly in America, they are really investing money into ME research. I think the Europeans are just need a little bit more pushing and prodding to get their governments to release funds for this. So there is some progress here. Uh, we need transdisciplinary, so it's a complex disease. We need people to work from other disciplines. We need to bring people in to the community to encourage them to work in ME, because that's how we'll maximize the benefit, I think. And particularly young researchers, because you, know, you look in the audience here and we're all probably never gonna see 40 again. Um, but we need young people to come in and really um, push this research on. And some of the things that we can look at in the way we compare our studies is we need consistency in study design. 
patients and control, what groups, what do we use as controls, what's the most appropriate control group, and standardizing and using the same operating <coughs> protocols. Simple things, but it makes a huge difference in allowing you to compare the results from one study to another. Uh, and then data analysis. Data analysis is gonna become a significant bottleneck for all of us, because all these very highly sophisticated technologies we're using generate masses and masses of data. So we are going to need informaticians, we're gonna need systems biologists to really help us integrate that. And some of us are already starting to work on that. Um, but it'd be good if we could develop something that makes it accessible to all researchers. And I think in, um, Vicky mentioned uh, there were some important initiatives in, in that direction, so that's really good. And then long-term studies, as I said, we do need these, and we need biobanks. So we're collecting samples, we can bank them and use them in a variety of studies. Um, and this is not just blood, it should be other tissue samples, other body fluids as well. And then right at the bottom, it's sort of the obvious, is we need um, placebo-controlled blinded trials that are sufficiently powered um, using agreed or endorsed quantitative outcome measures to really know that we've been able to treat and hopefully cure ME. And that is it. So I'd like to thank you all for coming. It's been great to see everybody in person. And I hope to see many of you next year, the next colloquium. Thank you very much.